على رسولنا محمد الصادق الوعد الأمين وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين وأصحاب الكرام ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين اللهم افتح لنا أبواب العارفين رب شرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي رب زبني علما وفهما وأرحقني بالصالحين رب يسر ولا تعسر رب تمم بالخير آمين We are in the 10th session explaining the book of Imam al-Tahawi's Creed and tonight we're going to start from point 106 we pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blesses the author of this book Imam al-Tahawi and all of us who are listening to his work here and our brother Hafiz Fawaz is going to start reading the Arabic text. No. So this point is quite long compared to the other points of the text. I'm going to get straight into the translation of it. The divine enablement, enablement that an act requires, for example, an act of obedience, which cannot be attributed to a creature, occurs concurrent with the act so it's integral with the act itself as for the material as for the material enablement that results from health capacity poise and sound means it precedes the act so here it exists in a person before the act. So even though the act itself did not take place yet, but that act has existed before and it is a part of the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In sacred law, it is upon the ladder that it is upon the ladder that legal and moral obligation hinge just as God, the sublime and exalted, states, God obliges no soul with more than its own capacity. In other words, these deeds or acts that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mandated upon the individuals to perform, they're not burdened upon the individuals. And they're not given in order to wear them off. But they're given, they're assigned to the, to the individuals in order for them to better themselves. Or sometimes to be tested. But God will not put a burden upon the individual more than that individual can be able to handle. As the Imam puts right here at the end of this, uh, this point, لا يكلف الله نفسا so this is something very important and actually it helps a lot of believers to know that God, no matter what you go through in life, let's say you have a disease, let's say you have decrease of wealth, anything that happens in life, remember that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala placed it for a reason and he placed it there because you are able to carry that. When you know that, then you are more comfortable receiving whatever comes to you. Your approach toward the test or your approach towards the ibtila, as it is called, or the trial, is a different way from the test of a non-believer. A non-believer can just fall for it and just go like crazy and say, you know what, commit suicide sometimes or end up in depression. And there are so many complications that a person can end up with. 
simply for, for not being convinced and not knowing that whatever comes comes from God and God is not going to overload you with something more than you can handle yourself. But sometimes we exaggerate those things. Like if I have to go through a hardship, all right, let me get ready and let me go through it. But other people, that's not their approach. They would say, no, there, there is no need to get ready. I'm just, as they say, freaking out. Like exaggerating the thing. Like, oh my God, look what happened. Probably people before you, they have went through worse than what you're going through. And you, yours is nothing compared to what others they have been through. And they pass their tests. They pass their, these trials. But because you are just uh, aggravated and you're so anxious... You're thinking that God is placing a burden upon you more than what you can handle. So that's why I'm saying this belief and this knowing that God will not place you more than what you can handle. It eases things and it makes the believer go through the tests or trials in an easier way. Yes. <laughs> Naam. So, وَأَفْعَالُ الْعِبَادِ هِيَ خَلْقُ اللَّهِ وَكَسْبٌ مِنَ الْعِبَادِ Human actions are God's creations. But humanity's acquisitions. What does this mean? It means that if you're going to do something, let's say for example, perform a prayer, which is something positive. The act itself the chance that God has given you, the opportunity that He has given you, the enablement of that deed, of performance of the prayer, it is something that God is putting it there. He is making it happen. But this is based on your intention. The reward is based on your intention. You intended to do that. Therefore, God, inshallah, is going to reward you for that. Same concept applies to the shartu, something that is harmful. Still, God is the one who's creating that. God is the one who's making that happen. Let's say, for example, if you did decide to, you know, if you decide to destroy a mosque, you decide to destroy a mosque, to burn a mosque down. Whose work is this? In reality, it is God's work. It is not your work. Because if it is up to you, you cannot make that happen. If God did not will. But it is God the one who wills. And that's taken place. So God is behind that. Making it happen. But is God to be judged for that? No. Are you going to get punished for that? Most likely. Because it's you who initiated that. It is you who intended to do that. But God will make things possible. Either good or bad. We say khayrihi wa sharrihi min Allah ta'ala. The good and the bad comes from God. So this is how we understand that good and bad can come from God. So, or it's like when we say that we're taking a medication. We're taking the medication. We're just taking the mean. The cure is coming from whom? From Allah. That pill working in our body, who's making that work? Not the pill itself, no. Not you yourself, no. <sighs> It is God the one who is making that happening. So he is involved in all of these um, processes, if we can call them. He is involved in all of these processes. And he's the one who makes things happen, whether good or bad. Any questions in regards to this point? Before we move on to the next point? The one before it, when you said Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make the things happen. Yes. Not to give the burden on the people. Not that much that they cannot adopt it, but still people do suicide when they give, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala don't give the burden that much, then why still they do the suicide? They still do suicide because as I said, they become anxious and they think that they are unable to deal with what's approaching them. Americans say they freak out. So they just exaggerate and they are unable to, to perceive just like, oh my God, look what happened to me. No, no, God sent that and you are able to handle that. But you are convincing yourself that you are not able to do that. So you become the enemy of yourself. 
this is a wrong approach. This is what people, they get in trouble from, you know, from exaggerating things or from beginning anxious about certain things that God has placed for you and he knows that you will be able to handle them. Yes, yeah, so we explained this one. Walam? Right. So God, the sublime and exalted, has only obliged human beings to do what they are capable of doing. Prayer, it is something that you are capable of doing. Fasting, you're capable of doing. Hajj, you're capable. So all the obligations that he has given you, he has given you because knowing that you are capable of performing them or doing them. And they are only capable of doing what he obliged them to do. <coughs> Hence the meaning of no strength or power exists save by means of God. We assert the, the saying, لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله, which means again that no strength or power exists save by means of God. We assert that no one's strategy, move or change can avert anyone from any act of disobedience to God. Unless accompanied by God's providence, nor has anyone the ability to initiate and fulfill duties to God, save by the providence of God, the sublime and exalted. This point now is taking this conversation to another level, to a deeper level. And to make it simple, the author here is talking about even when it comes to guidance, it comes from God. When it comes to misguidance, it's also something that is enabled by God. He guides whomsoever he wishes, and he leaves in misguidance whosoever he wishes. Now, again, this is very similar to the actions that you perform. Remember earlier we said the actions, the deeds? So also guidance and misguidance, it is similar to the deeds as well. That he is behind it. He is behind it. It is not you who is getting guided. It is not you who is getting misguided. It is God who is making that happening. But again, you are responsible for that. Like God is going to guide somebody if he knows that there is khair in his heart. If he knows that there is something good in his heart. If he knows that he is able and capable to embrace the guidance. And interested to receive that guidance. Otherwise, those who are not interested to receive the guidance or those who fight against the guidance, those who fight against the religion of God, then he makes it possible for them not to be guided, to be misguided. So it is God who is behind misguidance. However, it is the human who is initiating that. So it is based upon the human. And based on his intention and based on his will, he will be either punished or rewarded in the hereafter. I tried to make it simple and I believe you guys were able to understand this point. Any questions? All right. So let's move on to the next one. 109. Everything is confluent with the will of God. Meaning that everything goes according to the will of God. Nothing can happen outside of His will. Like he wills something, you will something else, you have a different will, and your will is not going to work, unfortunately. 
but it's going to be whatever God wills. And we know this, we talked about this one earlier as well. وَعِلْمِهِ وَقَضَائِهِ وَقَدَرِهِ But here is not just the knowledge of God, here the Imam is including the, the knowledge of God as well, the judgment of God and also the decree of God. These are different components that are all important parts of the um, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guiding things or or opening paths to certain things. Yes. Yeah. So this is very simple point too. His will supersedes all other wills. Just as his decree thwarts all roses to avoid it. So is he is he being evil? So he's pure from any you know people they may accuse him and say, Oh God is unjust. God is unjust. Look what he's doing to the children. Look, he's sending a hurricane here and there. Why is he doing that? Allah subhanahu wa taqaddasa an kulli su'in wahin. Pure from every evil or adversity. And transcendent is he above any blemish or per perversity. So anybody who says any bad words to God, he is above that. He is transcendent above that. He is not questioned about what he does. We as creatures, we have no authority to tell him, God, why are you sending this hurricane here? God, why are you causing the death of so many people here and there? لا يسألوا عما يفعل وهم يسألون You know, he cannot be questioned on what he does, but they, meaning the creation of God, us humans, we're going to be questioned on what we do. He has no God above him. We have a God above us that we are responsible to. Yes. In the supplications and charities of the living, there is benefit for the dead. Again, in the supplications, when we make du'as, or when we give charity, sadaqah, on behalf of somebody who passed away. So this is a different su subject now. So when we do that, definitely a that Prophet Ali Sallallahu mentioned is cut. Charity. For example, he builds a mosque or she builds a hospital. He leaves behind a book. He leaves behind, let's say for example, pays for, you know, a thousand copies of the Quran in the English language. And then people, they distribute these English copies to the others. And many of other people, they end up accepting the religion of Islam after reading the Quran. He has become the sabab for their conversion. Even though he's dead, he is still receiving these rewards. And this can also be a part of the sadaqah jariya. Uh, so the ilm is more when you yourself actually contribute from your knowledge in... Uh, guiding others or for example if you're going to translate yourself in a language that was not translated and so on and the other one is uh, so a, a son a righteous son or a daughter who does who prays for the father or mother 
So, so again, in the supplications and charities of the living, there is benefit for the dead. Yes. God the sublime and exalted answers prayers and fulfills needs. God answers prayers and he fulfills needs. So this is very self-explanatory and it is very easy to <coughs> comprehend. We can move on to 115. <laughs> he possesses everything and nothing possesses him. This is what distinguishes the creator from the creation. Yes. Nothing is independent of God. Nothing is independent of God. What does it mean independent of God? Saying that I am on my own. Nothing. Like people outside, for example, there's a lot of these atheists who say, we're just created out of, you know, we came out of the monkey from, from these apes or our origin is the fish and we evolved and this and that and we have nobody who we have to be uh, accountable to. So we're just independent on our own. We're just an independent creature. Yes, to a certain level we're independent for sure, but not in a complete way. We have somebody who is in charge of us. So that's why he says, nothing is independent of God. Even for the twinkling of an eye. Even when you close it like this, still that needs Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in order for that to be performed, to take place. Whoever imagines that he is independent of God, for even the twinkling of an eye, Can angry, but also he can um, he can also have pleasure, but not like any not like of any human being. <coughs> so he can get angry and he can get happy, pleased. I would say pleased. That's a better word, but not like the human being. When a servant does something good, of course he is. Pleased, yarda. But when a servant does something bad, all you know, he can be angry, yaghdab, and he gets angry. But again, not like any human being. Like we start acting in a certain way when we get happy. Sometimes we don't know what we're doing. Why? Because we're limited. Uh, this is this is nuqsan. Uh, this is something. Um, you know, this is something uh, as negative, that we're not in full control. Or when something bad happens, we lose our mind sometimes. And we don't know what we're doing. When somebody tells us a word, we tell a hundred words behind. Or when somebody punches us once, we punch them or we kill them, you know. So this is again um, a reaction, which is not a normal reaction. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is above all of these kind of reactions that the humans, they do react when they get angry or when they get pleased. But it's important to know that he is, he can get angry and he also can get pleased, but with his own, in, according to his own uh, ways, not according to human ways. Yes. Yes, 
This is also a very important point. 118. We love the companions of God's messengers. God's messenger. The Sahab Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We love them. Generally speaking, we love them. Were they all pure from sins? No. They did commit sins. They did commit mistakes. However, we know that they are our masters. The first generation, the second generation, and the third generation, these are the best generations of the Ummah. And we shouldn't have bad thoughts in regards to them. When the companion is mentioned, we think positively. So we love the companions of God's messenger. We are not, however, extreme in our love for any one of them. Meaning that we don't consider any one of them to be like divine or to be like Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. No, we don't consider. Why? Because there are other groups who would raise certain companions to such a level where their whole theology becomes love for those certain companions. Their whole aqidah evolves around that. For example, Sayyidina Ali or Sayyidina Hassan and Sayyidina Hussein. We do love them. We consider them Ahli Bayt. And we have a great love for Ahli Bayt Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And they have their fadail, they have their virtues. Mentioned by Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We're commanded to love them and all that. But we cannot put them in a level where they are considered as holy. Or they're considered as, uh, when I say holy, I mean like divine or like the Prophet himself. No, we love them, but we also love the other companions as well. Can we have more love? Yes, for Ahli Bayt, definitely. We should love more Ahli Bayt than the other companions, no doubt about it. But we don't go into extremities. This is the key word. We don't go into extreme love and make everything just talking about, for example, Sayyidina Ali, Sayyidina Hassan, and Sayyidina Hussein, radiallahu anhum jamiyan. We don't do that. Nor do we associate from any one of from any of them. Disassociate, sorry. Nor do we disassociate from any one of them. Like you have, for example, people who say like about Sayyidina Muawiyah, for example. They consider themselves to be Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah. But they would say we have no respect for him. Yes, we'll you know go with it because he but he A prayer as well, so they're fiqh. We derive rulings out of those hadiths from Sayyidina Muawiyah. And just to mention that there, so we don't put them down, the companions. We do recognize though that they made mistakes, especially Sayyidina Muawiyah with Sayyidina Ali when they fought. We definitely we believe that the truth was with Sayyidina Ali. However, that doesn't give us the pass, the license. Or the permission to say that Sayyidina Muawiyah was no good. It's like we know his heart. It's like we know his intentions. No, we don't. We have husnudlan. We have the good opinion in regards to the companions of the Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and we do recognize that some can make mistake. We are on the side of Sayyidina Ali, and we believe that he was right. But again, like I said, that doesn't make me <coughs> a person who is going to say bad things in regards to those who made a wrong choice and not consider them as the commands of the Prophet <coughs> so so uh, we love those who love them and we only mention their merits 
Generally, when we speak about them, we speak about their good things. Loving them is essential to religion. <coughs> Faith and spiritual excellence. <coughs> Excuse me. And hating them amounts to infidelity. Hating them amounts or it leads to infidelity. What is infidelity? Kufr. Hypocrisy and extremism. And we know those who speak bad about the companions in general, they are covered with these wrong qualities, with hypocrisy, infidelity, and also extremism. Yes. This is what the Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah assert. We assert that the Caliphate, after the death of the Messenger of God, was first for Sayyidina Abu Bakr Siddiq, due to his preeminence and precedence over the entire community. And there are many hadith of Nabi Alayhi in regards to the virtues of Sayyidina Abu Bakr. One of them, if the faith of the whole Ummah would be on one side of the scale, and the faith of Sayyidina Abu Bakr would be on the other side of the scale, this side of the scale that has the faith of Sayyidina Abu Bakr would be heavier than the scale of the rest of the Ummah. This is the virtue in regards to Sayyidina Abu Bakr. And then we assert that the Caliphate after the death after Sayyidina Abu Bakr was to Sayyidina Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu followed by Sayyidina Uthman <coughs> bin Affan radiallahu anhu and concluding with Sayyidina Ali ibn Abi Talib kabramallahu wajha. They are guiding caliphs and guided leaders. These are the Khulafa al-Rashidin al-Mahdiyin. And Prophet Ali Sallallahu he says that stick with them, stick with these Khulafa al-Rashidin. Like grab hold to them, grab hold to their teachings as well. Yes. <laughs> No. Still, we're talking about the companions. So again, this is our aqidah, this is our approach, this is our attitude towards these companions of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That's why it's very important to understand how our aqidah balances our, our love towards these companions. We testify as the Messenger of God والسلام, before us that the ten whom he designated and assured of paradise are indeed in paradise. While they were alive, during the lifetime of the Prophet ﷺ, he gave glad tidings for these ten people that they are already going to be in paradise. They are actually already in paradise, written to be among the dwellers of paradise, and he gave the glad tidings. How happy must they, they must have been. And they deserved, based on their efforts in order to be among the dwellers of paradise. So for us, it's very important to study their lives and to do what they did in order for us also to be in paradise with them and with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That's why studying their lives is very important. And being like them, trying to emulate them is very important. Who are these? Sayyidina Abu Bakr, 
Sayyidina Umar, Sayyidina Uthman, Sayyidina Ali. So you have all the four Khalifas, they are part of these <coughs> ten. And then you have the other six. Talha, Az Zubair, Sa'ad, Sa'id, Abdurrahman bin Awf, and Abu Ubaidah bin Al Jarrah, who is the trustee of the community. He is considered to be Aminul Ummah. It is a laqab, it is a nickname that was given by Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That's why the author here is saying that Abu Ubaidah bin Al-Jarrah, he is the trustee person of this community, of the Ummah of Sayyidina Muhammad alayhi wa sallam. Amin al-Ummah, given by the Prophet himself. Inshallah, I will take it upon myself in the future to have some sessions in regards to all of these companions and talk about their lives. Maybe each session, talk about 20 minutes or maybe half hour, whatever we can. And so we can reflect upon their lives and try to resemble them, inshallah, in the future. <coughs> So we're going to stop tonight inshallah with this last point and this is the last point in regards to the you know the talk about the companions of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and the author says here whoever speaks well of the companions of the messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam his chaste wife his pure wives and his purified progeny meaning his purified Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has purified Ahlul Bayt the family of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam has purified and this is actually mentioned in the Quran so whoever speaks well of his companions whoever speaks well about his wives and whoever speaks well about his progeny is absolved of hypocrisy. Meaning that for that person to be a hypocrite would be very hard. He is protected from hypocrisy. As long as he has this husnul dhan, this good opinion in regards to the companions, the wives, and also the family of Rasulullah alayhi wa Naam. So we pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes us among those who have the purified creed, aqidah in their hearts and they act according to it. We pray that he makes us among those who love the companions of Rasulullah and they try to follow their examples inshaAllah ta'ala. Wa akhiru da'wana an alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. We also pray that he makes us among those who love Ahli Bayti Rasul and um, his, uh, his wives as well. وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين. بارك الله فيك. أني. أني questions.